Hello, everyone, and welcome to Grip Locks, Foundation Disc Golf's weekly podcast. I'm Hunter, joined, as always, by Trevor, and we got something exciting for you this week. Sure do. Tournament results. Wow. Finally. Finally. It's Shelly been so Sharp. long. The Shelly Sharp Memorial happened. It went down in Arizona. It's the year's first A-tier that I know of. Let me just say, first of all, that I am so jealous that they're out there playing. I mean, we got we got a taste of that when we went to Texas, but to see them playing in shorts and in a it t-shirt. looks nice out. Mm-hmm. And they're just at that beautiful park. It, it makes me very jealous. Yeah, um, it had coverage. First off, if you're if you're interested in watching some golf, it's disc been a while. Guy. The disc golf guy Terry Miller, shout out to him. He was out there. Uh, he has coverage of all three rounds it's of the coverage. MPO yeah, MPO coverage. lead card. Um, so let's just I'm gonna quickly run through the results and then talk through some of it. Uh, on the MPO side, we had Adam Hammis taking it down yeah. over Drew Gibson coming in second place. And then Anthony Barella, your boy, my boy, in third place there. He gave it a good um, on the try. FPO side. We had Own Scoggins t- taking it down over Jennifer Allen, and then Hannah Stefanovic. <laughs> Stefan, dang it! I was I practiced this so much I wouldn't butcher it. Stefanovic. Stefanovic. Hannah Stefanovic. I mean, I read that upside down. That wasn't that hard. It was just I got flustered. Okay? You got, it's tough. I Hannah Stefanovic it. came in third place there. Um, Owen Scoggins kind of ran away with it. I, yeah. I didn't see too much of a storyline on the FPO side, other than Owen Scoggins is the one of the newer End of a Star team members. Yeah, she's up and coming a bit. Uh, and smacked out, not smacked out. She she beat Jennifer Allen by like seven or eight strokes for three rounds. It's impressive. So it kind of shows the type of not, the type of talent she has, what she's capable yeah, of. Yeah, that doesn't surprise but me. But on the MPO side, there is one main story I wanted to look at here. Which was Adam Hammis looked good. He looked, he looked like from like a you know outside top ten guy to like oh my gosh Adam Hammis might win a couple elite series events this year. Yeah, I mean first off season debut players normally look a little rusty. I didn't be. see a sign of rust. No. I mainly watched the final round. I, I think watched. his his first round was his worst round. He got progressively better. Yeah, he went his first round was not good, and then he went like ten seventy ten eighty. We don't care about ratings. I'm just kidding. No, yeah, he popped off. Just he, for perspective. His third round was like a, a 47, I believe, and the, the previous hot was a 51 by Drew Gibson, which Drew Gibson went 51-51. Nah, he went 59-59. Drew Gibson? Pretty sure it was. Connor. Was we got it, Connor yeah. here to fact check us. Shelly Sharp Memorial. I'm almost positive he went back and back 59. No, he definitely went 51-51-57. And what the Drew graphic Gibson was wrong, maybe, because I could have sworn. Maybe it was 49? I swear it ended in a nine. It was like a Pro Tour graphic. Go to the Pro Tour's Instagram. No, you're telling him mixed mixed emotions. He needs to go to PDGA and look it up. Well, no, because I want to know if that graphic's wrong then. That's what <laughs> I saw. That's what my source was. Uh, I mainly watched the final round for Adam Hammes, and his throws seemed like they were a little bit off when he started. But he his that far off. He was just sitting around like 28 feet for the first like eight holes. Exactly. And he didn't miss it. That's what I was about to say. His putter was anything but off. That course is so skippy, though, that like, his throws were clean. You get those flare skips out there, especially this time of year, that like you're gonna a lot of your stuff's gonna end up outside the circle or like just at the edge and he just wasn't missing. Yeah, he, he was not <laughs> he was not missing it's incredible. from I mean, even just outside the circle. You're and talking about Drew Gibson. Drew Gibson. Yeah. His his overall rating? No, his, his round scores. scores. Uh, round one fifty one. Mm. Round two fifty one. Mm. Mm. And, and fifty seven. I have oh, to, 56. Okay, I, I was one shirt off on the finals. The graphic now because I'm going to be So upset. Connor just confirmed 51, 51, 56 for Drew Gibson. Drew Gibson had a, a solid start, but I think it's kind of what we've seen with Drew in the past. Yeah, well. His consistency just wasn't there for the full tournament. When I it's watched, all, it's all okay, it here it is. Back to, it was 51. Yeah, it was nine wrong. down. It was nine down. That's where I got the Do nine. not try to salvage no, yourself. You're criminally wrong. I was okay. wrong, but I knew there was a nine there somewhere. So at least I'm not com- criminally insane. Yet. Yeah, okay, that's fair. I watched his last round, and he had two problems. Number one is uh, his putter, which has always been a problem for him. He commits those putts, but, man, when he rips them, he's skipping off the basket. He's yeah. flaring off the chains. like He's going way past. And then number two, he kept throwing discs on Heiser that like he seemed like he was expecting them to flip up, and they weren't. Like He kept missing left like That's over weird. and over and over again. He kept throwing this orange buzz he had and then that red wraith that he throws all over the place. And he was releasing them on too much hyzer. He wasn't flipping anything up. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, just wasn't quite there. When he when it initially started, I was already thinking about this podcast what we were going to talk about, and I was going to say I underrated Drew Gibson. He surprised me, but then his final round makes same me feel old, same old. yeah. I was like, okay, he he is what I thought he was through this tournament. Could he he just basically he has all the skills. He has everything he needs to be a top level player, a top ten player, a top five player. 
He just doesn't have the consistency. He yeah. he has not to, to to me yet proven that he can go out there tournament after tournament, round after round, and put up top level scores. Yeah, I I mean I think even when his throwing is there, I think his putting is really just yeah. It's mainly his putting is the biggest deal. Like I think he knows that you can look thrower. at a there was a pro tour interview at the beginning of last year, might have even been at the memorial where he was talking about that. Like yeah, you know I think I'm a, it's the a best thrower thing. out there, but it, putter. Well, <laughs> whenever you've been playing, every player's yeah. gonna say the best. Whenever out you've there. been playing the game as long as Drew has, and even as long as like you and I have, like putting is. You only uh, the skill aspect of putting. You only it only takes so long to figure out. It's all it's mental. It's just in your, yeah. It's, it's in all in your head because like every almost every guy on the pro tour is capable of making every putt. It's just a matter of if you can throw your best putt. Yeah, which is all in your head, and it, it's a tough thing to do. It's very difficult. Um, but Adam Hammis, on the other hand, he he, almost, locked he looked mid season form to me. I'm very. I almost think I underranked him at number nine in the world. It'll be interesting once he gets out there with against a full field. But to see him, he was down a few strokes going into the final round. He hadn't played bad those first two rounds. First round was a little rough. Second round wasn't bad. Third round was insane. He lit it up. Hey, and let's not sleep on my boy AB. He kept pace. I mean, nobody was going to catch Hammers, but AB looked good. That's all I'm saying. He's in my top 20, and people probably think I was dumb for that, but yeah. he looked good. He uh, throws far, man. He does throw far, it's but really it, takes, cool. it takes more than that. And you know He's playing an ultra boost. I don't know what to say. <laughs> You, you you need to come out with a, a top twenty style. There there's really not a lot of players that are notable. Nico, yeah, like AB. AB is like cool. Nico is like out there, and then after I that, I feel like Paul's got a solid style. Yeah, because it's he's like professional. He's always put together well, right? But like other than that, like it just gets into like a, it gets kind of mushed. guys with their neon dry fits on, and it's like, well, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> there's just like it's not like it's awful, but it's like you know, it's there. That that is they, a valid. It's point. just a lot of generic looks going on. You know, disc golf has established their it's like generic fashion look at this point, and it's like cargo shorts and a neon dry. Okay, fit. cargo shorts are not a generic disc golf look. There's no one. All right, whatever. Okay, there's very few people out there playing in cargo, not cargo shorts. shorts. I really meant like golf shorts. You don't even. A lot of times you see like guys just wearing. Okay, if I picture a disc golf outfit, this has nothing to do with anything we're talking about. If I picture a disc golf outfit, I'm picturing golf shorts. Nike like mid shin socks. Oh yeah, and a golf polo that's not tucked in. Yeah, and a backwards hat. I, see, but it doesn't have to be backwards. More guys, I hat. feel like more guys are not even wearing the polo than are. But it's kind of shifting the other direction, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Whatever. Off topic. I mean, all, all I gotta say about it is if you haven't seen the regulate the pants clip. Yeah, I have fully explained oh, my that thoughts was on it. So funny. Just gotta regulate the pants, man. Regulate the pants. I so. Mean. Uh, one one other thing that tends to always 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 happen to us is we record these podcasts on Wednesday. It'll probably happen this week. We record these podcasts on Wednesday. We drop them on Thursday. That gap in between is when every player decides to make decides all the to announce it. Yeah. yeah. So it happened last week. Ezra Ezra Aderhold has officially announced maybe two year deal with Discraft. Maybe if we're trying to get somebody to announce, we ought to just make a podcast about it. And then it we, we tried it with James Conrad. It didn't work, but James is probably going to announce right now. Yeah. Probably while we're filming this podcast, yeah, he he's going to announce. Just put it on Facebook. Yeah. James Conrad. James Conrad leaks it. <laughs> yeah. No, James Conrad is probably about to announce, but we do know Ezra has officially announced Discraft for two years. Uh, we debated it. We've looked through where we thought he was going. Um, it was pretty up in the air, but they also immediately released a tour series nuke. Sold a bunch of them. Sold a lot of them in 25 minutes. I actually got a little bit of an inside scoop uh, from Discraft. I was just on the phone with them talking about other stuff. Turns out they had listed a certain amount, saw the demand, listed more, and just started cranking them out, making them in the back because they were like, wow. this demand is higher than we thought. Yeah. So that's kind of why it took Wish a little bit that. longer <laughs> is they were adjusting the number on the site to match the demand. Mm. So it's, it's pretty crazy. They um, cool. But, you know... What are your initial thoughts on him choosing Discraft, both from Discraft side and from Ezra's side? Uh, what What do you think of the signing? Well, for Discraft, no brainer because um, now, well, and I know we're going to talk about this later because I was about to say uh, it's his first pro contract, therefore they probably got him on the cheap. Yeah. Now he was being. We'll talk about this later, but he was being represented by Nate Perkins, so maybe that helped him make a little more than he would have. But like in any case, he's still probably gotten for a very good value. So that makes the signing way lower risk uh, for Ezra. Uh, as far as Ezra's move, he really could have gone anywhere uh, 
and done just fine for himself. So I think it's really more on Discraft's thing, uh, on their kind of point of view, like whether it was good or bad. And I think it's a great signing. Ezra's like the most unpredictable player for me. Like I have no idea yeah. if he's going to just become really, really good. I think he could be super unproven. Um, he obviously does a bit with social media to like, he moves the needle a bit in disc golf. People really like him. Uh, so like, yeah, no brainer for, for Discraft. you know, good for him for getting a two year deal to where like, if he does get really good, even to like, if he's just good enough to like be a solid top 10 player because of his influence, he will be super, super popular and be mm-hmm. worth a good bit of money. A lot of people are going to be watching just to see where he finishes. Right. So like he could be worth a lot after a two year deal goes up. So yeah, really good signing. And I'm sure there's a lot of companies that are probably kicking themselves, like really hoping they could have gotten them. One thing that's interesting to me is I think this is one of the first players, if not the first player that we've seen go from unsponsored to elite team yeah elite team and like a big deal yeah not just like oh they got a new signing yeah because we saw brody go from unsponsored to a big deal but he's not on their elite team yeah he doesn't have a tour series disc he has the get freaky and the brody roach and stuff like Mm -hmm. that this might have happened at other you know on like a smaller scale but this is the first time that i've like noticed it to where someone's going from unsponsored Mm -hmm. he was sponsored by otv but unsponsored by manufacturer to fully sponsored with a tour series disc on their highest level team. Yeah. Um, which that shows me that Discraft is treating him like the player that I don't think he quite is yet, but is going to be soon. Um, sure. Maybe even this year, which I think that that might've been a big part for Ezra is I think some of the other companies might've been like, yeah, your, your social media is great. Yada, yada, yada. But you know, as a player, we need you to prove yourself a little more. Yeah. This is, that is not a fact. I'm not, I don't have inside sources on that. That's just my gut feeling. Like, I'm wondering if Discraft saw him for what he could be a few years from now. And, you know, they, they've they locked down their current players with Paul, Brody, Paige, Paul Ulibarri. Uh, I mean, the list can go on and on. Their team's stacked. Yeah. They've locked down their current ones to where they can throw a little bit money, a little bit of money, take a little bit of risk on an up-and-coming player. And um, it, one thing I found interesting in the Ulti World article is Paul Ulibarri quoted saying, he has the potential to be the face of disc golf, which Paul Ulibarri is the the captain of the yeah, team. He has the potential to be the face of disc golf. He's all the way buttoned up, does everything the right way. Well, that's an overstep a little bit, but like that's something you say as the team captain of Discraft. So like, sure. Well, that's where that's Gas where I'm getting this up. feeling from is like yeah. I think Discraft's looking at his future and almost offering him a contract that he might not have got elsewhere well, with because, other companies because he moves plastic. He'll pay for himself. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing. Manufacturers know that, like, regardless of a player's skill, they can take no risk on a guy like Ezra when he's going to sell. I mean, he sells all those nukes. He's he's just going to pay for himself. Yeah, the nukes. I mean, um, it, I think it's already impressive his demand that he's creating. Yeah, he had some great performances last year. I think he almost shot an eleven hundred rated round. Like he, get, don't get me wrong, he is were, no joke. There were moments, yeah. But he also he only started playing open in twenty nineteen. Yeah, he, he hasn't he hasn't established himself as a player, but he's established himself on the scene. Yeah, he does seem to have a good ethic. Uh, I don't know what his ceiling is because I'm not I can't quite tell. Obviously, he's in ridiculous shape, but I can't quite tell like what his athleticism looks like um, as far as like trying to navigate like what his ceiling is. He's obviously young. Um, he's around to stay for yeah. sure. He's going to be around for a long time. I just don't know if he's like world champ quality. I think it was a very smart move on both parties. Um, I especially think that the contract length was smart, um, yeah. mainly for Ezra. That's disc- a sweet spot for, di- yeah. for disc golf right now. Discraft probably would have liked to have locked him down a little bit longer, but for Ezra, I think it's smart because you don't know what you're going to be worth two years from now. Mm-hmm. He could this year go out and win a major, win a Worlds, and then his contract, you know, when it renews in two years, is worth five times what it could have been right now. Sure. Um, so it's definitely smart for him to have a shorter-term contract, but... Uh, I do think that it was, we kind of expected him to go there. What we didn't expect, though, was the Nate Perkins representing him, which first off, Nate Perkins also announced recently two-year extension with Discmania. Um, But I just think it's interesting that we see him, and to my understanding, Ezra isn't the only player that he has been representing. I think Ezra is the only one that he's been public about representing. But I think it's, what I find weird about it, or interesting about it, is you have Nate Perkins, a uh, Team Discmania player through and through, mm-hmm. representing and helping a different player negotiate a contract to like a rival brand. 
Yeah, it it's a weird dynamic. First of all, I, I first off want to say that the presence of agents in disc golf is great because um, we you, the last thing we want to see is athletes getting taken advantage of by manufacturers because they don't really know how to navigate contracts and they don't um, they don't want to be a, it's easier to have somebody else speak on your behalf and be assertive. And I know Perkins mentioned that on um, Smashbox. So sure, like that's great. The idea that it's Nate Perkins, so this this is interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one, you mentioned he represents a company. So, like, is he going to really act on the behalf of, uh, like, obviously he just got Ezra signed to Discraft, which is odd. But, like, is he really going to not show any favoritism to the company that pays his bills? Yeah. That's hard to say. Like, surely not. Um, and, I mean, maybe. But, like, if you're Dismania, then what are you doing? Like, that's, that's interesting. It seems like a conflict of interest to me. But then... Number two, I just wonder, like, what qualifies Nate Perkins? He hasn't been around the game for a super long time. And maybe he went to, like, I, I'm literally asking, like, maybe he went to school for this. But, like, guys who are, like, agents usually do their undergrad and then go to law school. Mm-hmm. Like, because the, the whole purpose of an agent is not only to know the market. And, like, that's one thing about having a guy who is a player uh, doing it for you is he probably has connections so he can probably gauge worth and what guys are making in their contracts. Yeah. So that's very helpful. But another part of being an agent is being able to look over contracts. Like, mm-hmm. that. that's like... It makes sure that's a player's the, not signing their life away. Right. That's where the law school part comes in is because you got to be able to look at these contracts and, and make sure they're structured and in the best interest of everybody. I've seen... If, I've seen... I want to say a decent amount, but I've seen probably five or six disc golf contracts. They're pretty simple. They're pretty straightforward. Yeah, they're it's, not, it's, it's nothing. Disc golf isn't quite there yet. Yeah, there's not a bunch of legal mumbo jumbo. Like if you're signing your likeness away, it's literally going to say yeah. like, we have the right to use your likeness. If you're yeah. signing, like I've seen it both with, you know, my own sponsors. I've seen some with Paul. I've seen some with other players to where I can read it and you, you don't have to sit there and like study it. You yeah. read it. It makes sense. I agree. I, I do think Perkins' most valuable tool is that he knows, he probably knows what other guys are making. So he can, because that's like the biggest thing is you don't want to go into a contract negotiation and just don't even know like what kind of number should yeah, be. Yeah, that's number. where, that's where I think it's, uh, like what you were saying earlier. I don't, I, I don't know why agents and disc golf hasn't taken off more. I think part of it is there's not enough money in there. It's just not the money. Yeah. Um, which is where I think it's a, a very smart move for, for Nate Perkins because. This, let's say that, now we don't know these numbers, but let's say that over this next year, he is the agent for 10 disc golfers on tour. And, you know, even if even if those 10 players are newer players, each contract he negotiates is worth $30,000 and he gets mm-hmm. 10% of their contract. There's an extra $30,000, you know, uh, income stream for him year over year that he just has to negotiate for. Right. You know what I mean? So if he's a good negotiator and can represent these players and say like, one good thing too about having an agent like you were saying is that he's going to quickly learn players worth because he's going to say like, well, wait a minute. I represented Ezra last year and he was able to get this from yeah. Discraft. You know, this new up and coming player, he's worth at least that to you. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? And he has a chip on his shoulder. Whereas if Ezra's sitting in that conference room, you're almost just hoping that what Discraft is telling you is actually what's best for you. Yeah. And that's how players have been up to this point. I feel like they, they don't, Unless you you're asking other players in your similar situation, yeah. like, hey, what are you signed for? Then right. you don't know. And I think beyond just contract negotiation, agents will get bigger as if disc golf gets big enough to work. Because right now, uh, a big thing agents are doing for other athletes is they're going to get you in commercials. Mm-hmm. They're going to get you on magazine cover. Like they're going to uh, give you those kind of deals. And right now in disc golf, the only deals you're going to get really are within disc golf. Yeah. So like those companies know where to find you. But, you know, if disc golf gets big, you know, if they're on ESPN all the time to where like, you know, um, you know, even if, you know, that local shop wants to use their local disc golf pro who's popular to, you know, endorse their product or mm-hmm. there's a commercial that wants it. Like that's the kind of things that agents can dig into and yeah. they can do that work for you, you know, find you extra money. and so where you don't things. really have to do much. I think at the end right. of the day, the 10 percent agent like fee that's that seems to be from talking to other people across the board that's kind of the norm yeah that's like the standard. um normally the whole idea behind it is it's kind of like using a good real estate agent like the your if you have an agent representing you your contract should be worth and the money you get yeah. should end up being like 20 or 30 percent more right. so that 10 percent that you're giving them is nothing because they got exactly. you way more than that oh agents have a tough same thing with an accountant yeah they have a tough job because they can get fired so quick because you're 
job is literally make that guy, make your guy money like, yeah. or he's not going to pay you. And it's, I wonder too, um, like the agent sports agency is one of the most cutthroat industries that exists. When I, I went to school on a track, like an undergrad track where some people would go in and they want to be sports agents. And like the professors will literally tell you, don't do it. Like it'd be the worst idea ever. Like they shut you down unless you're very gifted. And then they might pull you aside and be like, you could do it. They will literally shut you down because it is that cutthroat. So if disc golf gets big enough to where there's just like these job openings galore for agents, they will, they will pour their way in from other places. Like yeah. they, they will flood in quickly because it is so cutthroat. Yeah. One, one other thing that I thought was interesting, this is also from the Smashbox interview he did was Nate Perkins was talking about how, um, up to this point, with only without a few exceptions to this rule, but up to this point, we've kind of seen like you're on star team. This is your contract. You're on yeah, this is a champion good point. team. This is your contract. Blank, you're on elite. Blank, yeah, there's like contracts. a blanket contract. You just send the generic template. You know, fill mm. your name in here. Yeah, this is what you get. Yeah, type of a contract. Uh, and he's saying that doesn't make sense. It should be player by player because Ezra might be worth more or less than someone else i think the only players up to this point have been the exception is i know for sure paul well, yeah. we, we've seen paul's deals starting even back with innova i think it was i think it was innova when the la times released like four year uh what was it was it four year one mil deal is that what that was mm-hmm. i want to no he wasn't making i don't think he made a yeah. million dollars till his discraft i thought i thought his first discraft deal was four year regardless one we saw it um we saw it somewhere yeah. uh, where that was kind of announced. You, and I'm sure Ricky's into the same boat. We haven't seen Ricky's be as public. Um, Paige, you know, I remember they announcing Paige's is potentially the biggest disc golf deal in the history. Um, those players have been like the exception to this. But outside of that, players are kind of being forced into this mold that's already been made. And yeah. he's saying that doesn't really make sense. Um, so do you think that that's something that we should see across the board or do you think it should still be kind of like pick and choose the players that you break the mold for? Um, I think at a certain level, uh, well, first of all, I think manufacturers sometimes, well, really it doesn't really matter how many players they sponsor until you get to the high levels because as long, if they're just giving them gear and whatnot, mm-hmm. then who cares? Like that's, that's just them, um, you know, kind of trying to spread their brand. It doesn't cost them anything. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing. And like for those lower level sponsorships, like I don't have a problem with it being a blanketed thing because they're going to be very generic and they're going to be kind of loose. You're going to be offering the same thing across the board. Once you get to guys that are, I would say once you get to the guys and girls that are playing on the tour, Mm -hmm. like that kind of level, then yeah, I mean, I, I think they can start with like their boilerplate kind of like template for how they do contracts. And then, you know, I think to a player, even just to do something as simple as like a custom bonus structure for each player. Yeah. To where like, here are the goals we want to see out of you. So like, if we got a, a veteran player, like, oh, uh, we just want to see you, you know, finish top 10 in 50% of your events and you get this bonus. Or if it's an up and comer, like, hey, we just want to see you get like, if you get like three top threes this year, you'll get a huge bonus. Like custom bonus structure so that you're setting like specific objectives for those players. Like even that would make them feel like they're just cared about. Yeah. Uh, and like they can see what they need to do to fulfill their contracts a little bit better. Um, and then also, and I know this is something that's happening with the highest, you know, those few contracts you've mentioned, but like... Um, just doing catering certain contracts towards players who maybe um, are going to make a bigger splash on social media, but not necessarily on the leaderboard Yeah. or, you know, vice versa, like just cater those contracts. Cause it's not just gonna help the player. It can help the company, you know, get the most out of those players. Yeah. I think so, it's yeah. a great idea for companies to go towards, but I don't think all companies will adopt it. And here's my reasoning because, um, well, first off, if, if I was in charge of a company and I'm offering it, what I would do is my highest tour team. So elite series, star team, um, the core team for prodigy, those players would all have personalized contracts. Mm -hmm. The champion team, um, whatever's below elite team on discraft, yada, yada, those players would have blanket contracts. That's just similar to what you were saying, but this happens in other sports too, because if you remember when Steph Curry was talking with Nike, the reason he didn't go with Nike is he sat down in the boardroom Mm -hmm. and they still had Kevin Durant's name on the PowerPoint that they were showing to him. Mm -hmm. And they cut to a slide. It said Kevin Durant and him and his dad got up left. And then when he got showed up to Under Armour, Under Armour was like, shoot, like they had everything. They already had shoes designed for him. They already 
they cared. Mm-hmm. That's why he went with Under Armour. I think that's going to be a big thing we see where companies that really want a player, that's how they can woo them. You show up and we already have your Ezra Aderhold Tour Series nukes for you in your hand right. before I, we even signed you. I wonder you know like, I mean? how much that's happening already. Like how much like Ezra is a good example and maybe James Conrad is another example and I'm sure Paul was where like when these guys go around like uh, what are companies doing to like, yeah, just woo them. That's what I'm saying. I think it, I think that's a, a untapped market. I think it's not fully untapped. And just from my recruiting. head knowledge, I think that the reason we see the Discraft team we see is because of how good they are at this. Yeah, it might be. Um, because I, I know what they did with Paul when Paul got up well, there. Sure. Yeah. Um, we're seeing kind of what they did with Ezra because to already have all these nukes ready, they were planned well in advance. Mm-hmm. We're already seeing some of it. Um, just from the outside looking in and then my little bit of insider knowledge, I think that's why we're seeing the Discraft team we're seeing. Um, and so I think that the more companies are realizing that the more like, Hey, you know, let's just pick a random player. Anthony Barella is the free agent this year. You know what I mean? He shows up to, he shows up to foundation HQ and I got him custom ultra boost. You know what I mean? Or like whatever. We're ready. He said hi to me, to be honest. (laughs) But you know what I mean? And you're also never handing a player of that caliber a non-personalized contract. Right. Like you hand wrote in, you hand wrote in Paul Macbeth. Like, yeah, that's never happening. Yeah. Uh, But I think, I think that's going to be more and more a way, not necessarily like it's going to be an industry wide thing, but I think it's going to be a thing of when a, when a company really wants a player, Mm -hmm. They're going to roll out the red carpet when you get to town. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and they're going to wine and dine you and uh, take. <laughs> Keep going. No, uh, they're going to wine and dine you and, you know, treat you right so that when you're yeah. there, you end up with them. Um, I guess so. <laughs> it's now time for the fans' favorite segment it's of Trevor's Trivia. <laughs> Oh my word! I've watched too much of The Office, man. I could just hear Kevin in my head when I'm saying it. <laughs> and I don't. Oh, if you know, you know. If you All don't right. know, you shouldn't know. All right. Uh, so uh, today's uh, trivia is inspired by me. Like I'm getting so like anxious to like start doing trivia based on events again because it was so much fun to, that I can't quite do that yet because we're not there yet. But we're gonna do a little schedule quiz today. Okay. But I'm not gonna make it. Uh, it's just going to be the pro tour because, okay. you know, here at Foundation. Name Ricky Wysocki's full tour schedule and go. No. I'm going to, I'm going to, it's going to be two kind of like point structure, way to earn points here. You're going to get, you get a point for naming all the pro tour events on the schedule this oh, year. Gosh. And you get an, another point if you can do it in order. <laughs> I mean, go ahead and put my scoreboard as zero. You don't think you can name them all? They're, you know, all like, of them? There's one, 12. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 11. Seven, eight, 11 nine, in the finale. 12. Yeah. The finale. The finale. Okay. That is one finale. We're, start- <laughs> <laughs> We're starting it off at the Las Vegas Challenge. There you go. That's where the the cart and the wheels fall I off ne- the cart. You're difficult with these because I never know. There's some things you just know so well that you have no reason to. And then there's other things that you should probably know that you have no idea. Like this would be something that I would expect you to have a clue. No, I have no clue. I think we're going to Waco next though. You're two for two. And then think about the ge- geography. No, I, I that's what I'm doing, but I don't know all I don't know all twelve pro tour events is the thing. You're gonna you're gonna do this. Like is Texas State's a pro tour event? No. That was a legit question, and you just hurt my feelings with it. Um, <laughs> so Waco it. takes us into end of March, which would lead us up to the DDO. The DDO is... Dynamic Disc Open? That's not on the schedule this year. Is it glass blown? No. Why are those are on the schedule? I'm now just realizing. I wrote them all down from the website. The DDO is... Connor, get, Connor, look get up, on that. Connor, look get up the Dynamic that. Discs Open. Okay. Did you look look up the just look up the Pro Tour schedule and make yeah, sure it's okay. not on there? Well, you got I'll, the Pro Tour schedule and it's not on it, uh, or did I just miss it? <laughs> Suspense. I'm I'm dying right now. It's not it's on. It's not there. on. Okay, there. I thought so. Yeah. What? But they're still having the dynamic disc open because they just op- they're now seeing registration open. Maybe it's a Silver Series. It must be a Silver Series. This is well, main frick. stuff. Um. Oh, so now I'm really doing for a loop. Now I'm really you made me bamboozled. Think I was an idiot for a second there. <laughs> Jonesboro. Bang! Three for That's three. That's next? Yeah. Okay. You're doing pretty well here. One-fourth of the way through. 
Okay, so we went to Jonesboro. We're I'll give you a, I'll give you a little hint. The tough part is like the national tour is mixed into the how they travel. Let me, this yeah, year let too. me give you a hint because this will be a, this one doesn't quite make this one will be a considerable jump. The Jacksonville West. Open, uh, West. West. <laughs> Jacksonville is not a. Thing. Okay, so we're going San Francisco Open. There you go. And then we're going from there up to the Portland Open. There you go. Is Beaver State Flings? That's a national tour. It's a national tour. So we're at the Portland Open now. now we're taking another pretty significant jump. Pacific Northwest. I think that's when players go to Europe and they come back to Deglo. Bang. Yeah, and then they go from Deglo. This wow, I'm being impressed right now. They go from Deglo down to Idlewild. You're not quite at that stretch yet. Deglo. There's one We're in the Midwest. There's a sneaky one. We're in the Midwest. It's a newer event. Preserve. Yeah. Deglo to the preserve to Idlewild. No. Dang it. Not Idlewild yet. Deglo to the preserve. We're chilling you to the were preserve. You just at this stretch last We're, year. Is it is Ledgestone next? Ledgestone. See, last year Idlewild was before Ledgestone. Okay. So it goes Ledgestone then Idlewild. Yeah. Okay, we're at Idlewild now. Yeah. I think this is when they go east. So we're going. How far east? Green Mountain. No. <laughs> you you were right about being far east. MVP first. Yeah. Oh, so it goes MVP then Green Mountain and then the. Finale. I blame Nick Carl on that one because Nick Carl was told me that they were going from MVP. Down to the Battle for Bedford. They go from Green Mountain to the Battle for Bedford. Yeah. So MVP, Green Mountain, Finale. Yeah. That was a pretty good effort. So I kind of did it. Yeah. You knew all of them for sure. You no, I didn't. You could have named them all. Preserve. Uh, preserve. You would have forgot about the Preserve? I wouldn't have forgot about it. Yeah, I think you could have I definitely, them all. DDO. Did you, is the DDO even on like the Pro Tour? It's just an A tier? Or is it even an A tier? It doesn't exist. <laughs> it's gone. The dynamic disc open. It surely exists. All I'm finding is on their on dynamicdiscsopen.com. Yeah. It's something about the 2021 DDO Pro Panel presented by the PDGA. Maybe go to the PDGA website and search it, see if it's in there. But I don't know. That's shocking, to say the least. Um, <laughs> while he's looking that Wasn't up. Wasn't that a... I mean, Glassblown's been around forever. Yeah, Glassblown was fr- around forever. They rebranded it last year because they had to move yeah, it. they had one year of the DDO. To the DDO, and they decided, you know what, we're going to keep it as Dynamic Disc Open. And... They just put it in a toilet. But why is that not a pro tour? I couldn't tell you. Maybe it's a, it's a national tour. That's exactly what it is. Okay. It's an NT. Okay. Okay. We're crazy. We're cr- How did I not think of that? Was it not a pro tour last year either? No, it was a pro tour last year, but they added it because the NTs got canceled. Okay, Glassbone's okay. always been an NT. Now I, the DDO's an NT. Okay. Never mind, Connor. We figured it out. Also, Connor beforehand told me we would see the fastest Googling fingers. <laughs> and this man, <laughs> <laughs> this man's on a typewriter over there. <laughs> All right. Back to the Nate Perkins interview. Because I want to pull another thing out of it. Okay. Um, In the middle of his interview... Yeah, he's talking about contracts, and he goes, he's talking about how he thinks contracts should be public knowledge. <laughs> yeah, this is shocking. He used Paige Pierce as an example. Um, this isn't what was shocking, but he used Paige no. Pierce as an example and said he thinks people should know that very soon she's going to be a millionaire and that she's out there making. He literally said millions of dollars playing disc golf. Well, um, yeah, I mean he, that's that's. But bad. then. Terry Miller immediately goes. <laughs> yeah, so what's your contract then? Terry Miller is a savage. First of all, like that was amazing. Did not even blink. Just said, "Oh, then what do you make?" Oh, he Perkins? didn't even. He didn't even pause. He was literally just standing like this. And Nate, he let Nate finish. He goes, "So what's your contract?" It's kind of like he just didn't even blink. Didn't smile. Eventually, he laughed. But like at first, it's like Perkins though was trying to make a different point because Perkins was like saying that like people should know. Page's contract because it shows that hey, like this is a woman out there making a million dollars playing disc golf. It could help get people into the sport. Yeah. Like people knowing how much Nate Perkins makes does not matter at all. Like, I disagree. Uh, as far as I'm okay. Whoa, whoa. As whoa, far as whoa, getting whoa, whoa. people involved in the sport, that like if that was his first point. Yeah. As far as like point, as yeah. far as like everything else, whatever. But like as far as getting people involved in the sport, and I think that was his point. Yeah. Nobody. It doesn't matter what Nate Perkins. Yeah. Is so Nate immediately responded and was like. Well, my contract's kind of unique. Yeah, he went. He tried to. He tried to beat around the bush yeah. before eventually saying that he got. Oh, he got twenty G. He got twenty thousand dollars, a twenty thousand dollar check, which is based off of a two disc, two dollar disc royalty, um, and ten thousand Night Strike threes being made. But he didn't give a ton of details beyond that. Yeah. So we don't. We we got a little glimpse into Nate his Perkins, contract. Nate Perkins, this is in, makes at least twenty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> yeah. Or that um, year. So we already kind of talked about him being an agent. That's what I was going to go into a little bit next. But um, as far as, you know, why pros shouldn't be arguing directly. But 
I also want to hear your thoughts now on his idea of contracts being public. Yes. Yeah, what so do you think on this? My first, like when I first heard about this, I was like, well, yeah, of course, like other, you know, contracts are public, but then I had to think about it. Uh, and like, let's say Patrick Mahomes signs a new deal, right? He signed like the infamous, like half a billion, so much. Yeah. $500 million deal. Mike Trout signed a similar one. Well, those are public because those teams have salary caps. So like, people need to know what's going on because like they need to know how much their salary cap was right like yeah like and that team can only spend so much money now in certain sports should disc golfers have salary caps? no I'm just kidding. in certain sports like baseball you can just spend more than your salary cap and pay a ton of uh luxury tax and just pay to win looking at you yankees um <laughs> still doesn't win but um yeah like so that's that's kind of the reason why i mean if you look at I think there's two ways to look at it. Like if you're looking at like the ball golf arena to try and kind of pick this out. Like I remember when Rory signed with Nike this last time, it was like $300 million or something like that. It was a lot of money and it was announced. But I think in that regard, I don't know that it has anything to do with people like needing to be keyed in on that. It's kind of just Nike flexing at yeah. that point. I think when contracts in ball golf get announced like numbers wise, it only happens when that company is flexing. Nobody really needs to know what those signings are because it's not our public right. No. Yeah. And the agents are all so well connected and all represent so many players that they know what their players are worth. So it's not as important. Disc golf is different because the only reason we, you know, you and I advocate for it, not really because the public deserves to know. It's I, because I want to know, but we want to know. That's not my main reason. Yeah, we're nosy. <laughs> it's because we want the players to have an idea of what they're worth yeah, exactly. when they walk into the room. And so in that case, yeah, if like if there's no agent structure, then it almost has to be made public. But it doesn't, though. That's the yeah, thing. It doesn't. That's <laughs> the thing is it doesn't have to be. There is no it be, it's completely up to the company. Like, yeah. no, there is no the PDGA would technically be the only governing body that could say something. And even at that, they wouldn't technically have any yeah. right to. Hopefully we get to the point where companies are signing players for just so much money that they just want to flex it. Well, I think that's the thing you know? is um, it's kind of like my whole rangefinder argument. Here we go. The logic, right? Here we go. My rangefinder argument was until there's caddies in the sport, rangefinders have a place. Right. So you're saying until, until there's, there's agents. agents in the sport, public contracts have a place. Because if Nate Perkins, let's say that his agent thing takes off and he's representing 10 players, he has a good spread. He has a good idea of what each player is worth. So he can go argue for that player's worth. Until then, you only know, like as a player, you only know what your friends are making if they are willing to tell you. Yeah. Which talking about finance, you know, with your close friends, sure, but like. I would bet you half people listening here don't know what their coworkers I say next to is making. Those disc golfers are loose with it, though. I a mean, lot of them are. Yeah. A lot of them are. Um, but I'm just saying, in general, there's yeah. going to be some contracts that you know and some contracts you don't know. So the only number you know for sure is what you've made in the past. Yeah. So if I'm James sure. Conrad is a great example. If I'm James Conrad and I'm leaving Innova, I know my worth based on what Innova used to pay me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I have heard details... It wasn't enough when Innova was paying James Conrad. Sure, yeah. uh, and I think that James Conrad is not the exception to that. Mm -hmm. I think that he is the common player. And I think these players, a lot of them, are very good, but don't know their worth. And I yeah. think that there's a lot of companies that are getting away with it because they can. It's nothing wrong with the company. You know, you're making an agreement with the player. I think a lot of these companies are getting away with it getting away with underpaying these players because the players are willing to sign for that because they don't know what their competitors are making. Yeah. I think once people, if it was public and, you know, James Conrad is sitting in that room or whoever else, you know, I think you could put any number of players. I think that's probably why we're seeing players moving more is I think some of this is starting to become public and you're like, hold up a second. How on earth is uh, Trevor Staub beating me? Uh, how am I beating Trevor? nine times out of 10 of these events. And yet Trevor just told me he's making 75 K a year and I'm making 50. Right. Yeah. How does that make any sense? Yeah. If that conversation never happens, then the only way, like I, I have no idea what I'm worth compared to what you're worth other than, yeah, I should be worth more than him, but I don't know what that number is. So yeah. that's where I think public contracts is a great idea because it lets not even necessarily to the public, but it lets, even if it's only within a team, but I don't even like it in the team because sometimes your your value is a lot more to a different company. I would guarantee you players are worth a lot more to MVP and Dynamic Discs right now than they are to a lot of companies. Just because they need Because they need that face of the brand. Yeah. They need that. Mm -hmm. So I would I guarantee you that 
players are worth more to them than they are to Innova or Discraft or even Prodigy right now. All right, all right. Um, so it's not even within the company. I think it's got to be – that's the tough part. It's like I'm here saying it's got to be public, but like – doesn't have it to doesn't be. have to be public. <laughs> yeah. Like if I sign manufacturers don't. If wanna. I signed a player tomorrow, I'm not announcing on yeah. foundation. We just signed so and so for X amount, and yeah. like I'm not announcing that. I run in the business, you know. Yeah. So like we can say it's got to be, it's got to be, it's good for the sport as much as we want. But at the end of the day, if I'm sitting back and I'm Discraft or Innova or Prodigy, I'm all pointing at the other company, and be like, you announce it first, yeah, then first. I might be behind you. Right. <laughs> like. I don't know. I would like to see it simply from the aspect of the players. It gives them that blanket of security. Mm-hmm. It makes sure that like they're getting paid what they deserve. It's also making sure no one's getting way overpaid or mm-hmm. way underpaid. It's it goes on both sides of the coin. Um, but I don't think we're gonna see it. I think that the the for a while. the key is going to be agents and agents, multiple agents that are now representing fifty percent of the the field and those that those numbers are public to the agents. Dis, when disc golf media needs to get bigger too, because not right now there's no there's not really a lot of leaks in disc golf. But eventually media will get big enough in disc golf to where somebody says something and it actually comes back to bite them, you know? And like yeah. it leaks. Yeah. So that'll happen too. I think we're getting close to there. Because Maybe. I think there's I mean once I feel like I have so much, especially I'm probably the worst person to be on a podcast because I have so much random stuff in my head that I don't know if I'm allowed to say or not. I, same, yeah. And like, you're, I'm sitting here and I'm like, can I, did I just say something I can't well, say? Well, you forget where you heard things. Exactly. Yeah. And so you're like, did I hear that from a public, did I hear that from Instagram or did I hear that from Paul or did I hear that from, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. who the heck told me that and can I say it? Right. Eventually there's going to be someone who, who just doesn't care. Doesn't care. <laughs> it's like, frick yeah, I'm tweeting this. Yeah. We Part of me thinks we need that in the sport. It'll, I think I mean, it would be amazing. There'd be a lot more transparency. And people need to drop the Woj bombs. If you will. There needs to be Woj bombs. Woj bombs and disc golf. Like Ezra Aderhold. Guys on top of things, man. Ezra's deal should have been announced like two weeks prior to Discraft announcing it. And everyone's like, wait, wait, is this true? Is this true? And then Discraft drops it. Like, boom, well, it, it was get, true. Certain guys like like Woj is your example. Like in Schefter, like they get so big that like that's how certain teams want that news to hit. Yeah. <laughs> like they'll give it to them. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. I think it'd be cool to like have someone who's like, the go-to leak. There's gonna be one. You just give it. You give the information to him. He leaks it. There's a lot of speculation, yeah. and then it builds up hype, and then you announce it, and they're like, "Boom! It was right! Why? Wow! Whoosh. The crowd goes wild. wild." I don't know. It'd be cool. Yeah, I mean, there's guys like maybe that's how the co- the contract become public. There's guys like on uh, soccer Twitter that like there's like this one guy in particular, Fabrizio, who's like <laughs> literally is, like so well known for being like the, the source that like anything he says is like gospel to like anybody. Like if you hear it, like it must be true. And, yeah. he, and he'll say things so far ahead of when they happen. So like everybody is like constantly replying to his tweets. Like you have news on this guy, this guy, this guy. And during like transfer windows are open. Like, Oh, it's crazy. It's chaos. Yeah. I don't There's know. Gonna, I just feel be like that that'd guy. Be, that'd be such a cool, Hey, that'd be so cool to be that guy. Yeah. I would man. never be that guy, but it'd be so cool to be stressful be. when you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. But it would also be great. I think for the sport just to yeah. have that guy. The Jeff Corns bomb. Who is the guy? The, we corn, gotta find the him. corn dog. The will. corn dog. <laughs> Every time he drops one, it's a corn dog. <laughs> see that corn dog. Corn from, just hits with another good. deep fried spicy take. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. It's time to wrap the show up. We're going to head into Make That Call. All right. And Trevor, you know, I got a scenario for you. Yes. Yet again. Yes. We're here. We got a scenario. All right. All right. So Let's I'm going to take you back. It. I'm going to take your memory back. There we are. We're playing in the Cross County Classic. It the rained. Wolfpack Cross it County Classic. so much. Oh, that's a part of the story. It's a few years ago. It's final so round. We approach hole one. It wasn't raining that bad the final round, so. Oh, okay, I forgot my rounds. We approach hole one. Anyways. It's been pouring rain for hours. Okay. <laughs> hole one's tee just flooded with standing water. That That's how it was that first day. Oh, it was so bad. Yeah. Okay. NC State is who's on our card with us, right? Yeah. First guy steps up, proceeds to throw from behind the tee. That's Jort, man. I know it was. <laughs> Jort steps up, throws from behind the tee. Yeah. Never come close to the tee. Right behind it. Yeah. You're sitting there debating in your head, like, what the heck am I about to say? What rule do you call him on? What? Oh, see, now you're making this really hard. I got to know rules. I, why do I feel like we were all throwing from behind the tee? I vividly remember going, like, knee deep in that water, but carry on. I Maybe like you some, didn't. Were you, did you throw from behind the tee? I think the first round that you guys threw from it, and then, sec- and then they changed it. Yeah, they, they expanded it. They moved it after. the tee. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. We played we from it. Right. 
Okay. What rule do I call him on? I don't know the name of the rule. I just know, like, okay, okay, your gut feeling, what, do you, what the, are you saying to him? I, if I'm going to explain the rule, it's like you have to have one foot in contact with the T-surface at the time of like the releasing of the disc. So that'd be, you're, got, you're calling on a foot fault then? But is there's probably another rule for like just not even throwing from the tee box. Like there's probably just a rule that's like literally that. Like you, you have to throw from the tee box. All right. So you, with your knowledge of the game, what are you calling him on? I guess I don't think I could call him for a foot fault and it'd be wrong though. So you're calling foot fault. I would call foot fault. And it should be seconded. Um, Rongo. So it's actually nothing. Ooh. It's nothing. You can There's throw no rule. the tee box. No, you can't always. So if the problem with the T is a casual obstacle that cannot be easily removed, and then in parentheses, such as standing water, you can take casual relief behind the T. Getting tricked at this point. I mean, at this point, that's my goal. I mean, that T box was unique because it was literally like a sandbox. Like it was like there was like boxes wood around it. Yeah. So like it, it was almost like it was six like a inches bowl. deep. Yeah, it was like a bowl. Like it was it was just. I do think they they changed the T marking and let us more. Like I think they. I think put they put the flags, flags in. Yeah. It. Nah, I think we did tee off behind it. I, I but Ryan and, and I on that hole. Ryan and I that was our starting hole. No. Oh, Ryan and I in single started there. My, yeah, my singles round, I was popping off, and I got to that hole and took, like, a triple, shanked it into the woods. Ryan and I started on that hole, and or maybe we started, like, the hole before it. I was going to win. Yeah, okay. I was popping off. We we literally, like, we were, like, warming up and just going through it. We just acted like it wasn't there. That it hole sucked. was really hard. That was a tough hole. Creek OB there. It mm-hmm. was long. Long, like 400 we, didn't feet. Didn't we choke it? In, didn't we like in doubles? I remember specifically. We choked every hole double. We had like a putter up shot. And like whoever stepped up first. I think it was Pete threw it into the ground. And I got up there with my little PA4 like, oh boy, don't mess up <laughs> your first turn. Only thing I remember about that was. That was so bad. We were, that year, that was our year we were hot. <laughs> yeah, we were we hot until lost. that tournament. We hadn't lost. We step up into that tournament. And like our first doubles oh. hole, you and Pete teed oh. off and y'all throw it into the water. That one over the creek there? No, somebody. No, it was a par four. You threw it into this big old puddle, right? Oh, yeah. And then oh, Ryan and I step hole? up. I don't know. It was early in the first round. Hole. Yeah, Ryan no. and I step up and Ryan's like, you go first. And we're yeah. <laughs> I take casual relief back. And I pull, my, I pull my OG H1 out of my bag. We'd barely been playing with Prodigy by this point. I didn't know what I was about to do. Grip locked into a T, like literally <laughs> a tree. A tree. <laughs> yeah. Grip locked into a t- tree, literally like where Trevor is from me. Yeah. And it came behind me and landed next to me in the puddle. And then Ryan threw and it went OB. And so y'all decided to play for mine. And then Pete threw and he literally kicked water on my disc and said, I ain't picking that crap up. And then walked away. <laughs> and I had to pick up my disc. We and laughed then, way more than oh, we should have that entire time. We laughed so for the bad. first like six holes and oh, our score man. showed it. And it then we, so we played good after that, but it was yeah. never good enough. We, we couldn't get back. second, didn't we? Yeah. We clawed back. We never, we never could catch in some state, <laughs> though. Bad. Man. Co- collegiate disc golf so produced some fun. of the the best memories. <laughs> it's so fun. I'm hoping there's a season this year so we can cover it some. Give shed some no, light dude, on the collegiate disc. If they disc do, golf. if Clemson does alumni teams again, we're going. This little goon squad here is showing up and we're winning. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that our fourth? So much fun. Who's our fourth? Who are showing up with our fourth? Is Me, you, Connor. Is anybody in town? Pete Curran. We're flying we'll Pete Curran. Fly Pete in. I'll pay for the plane ticket. Yeah, I would do. In a heartbeat. That'd be a squad. That'd be great. All right. That's going to wrap it up for this week's show. Hopefully, you enjoyed, everyone. Um, let us know in the comments down below uh, what you think of the show, how we could improve. If you're on Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review. We read all of those. We take them all to heart, um, and we really appreciate it. But other than that, we'll be back with some more topics to talk through with you guys next week. <laughs> <laughs>